Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm, of course, your host, Andrew J. Polk, and today is Saturday, October 1st, and today we are talking about the many different resources and organizations involved in the archival process in our region, both in terms of preservation, restoration, research, and a whole lot more, plus the event they have coming up to showcase all of that and, of course, bring in new people to find out about it, about the great resources available for historic research in our area. So, of course, you can find us live on air, online, live streaming on KTSMRadio.com and with full video on the El Paso History Radio Show Facebook page and YouTube channel, as well as on some of our partner Facebook pages, including Remember in El Paso When, because this, of course, is the place where we say Texas history begins in El Paso. We do have a history moment today at the top of Hour 2 from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk, today talking about the Franklin Mountains and their many historical aspects aspects as well. So, our guest today joining us here in studio, we do have from my left to right, uh, Claudio Ramirez, the library archivist for the El Paso Public Rib- Library Border Heritage Center, Sue Taylor, chief curator of the New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo, as well as Dennis Daly, the department head of the NMSU Library Archives. Thank you all very much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank having you. Us. Great to be here. Yes. Absolutely. It's uh, not terrifically often that we have so much focused focus on history in the studio at one point in time here because sure we talk about a lot of many different subjects but the interesting thing about archives is that i mean sure there's a little bit of focus here including i mean claudia border heritage center but even that even within any of this anytime you're you're setting up an archive breadth tends to be one of the focuses at least in my experience i mean depth as well but getting as many topics in a lot of different ways and keeping it preserved and available for the future. So very, very happy to have you all in studio with us to talk about these things. And particularly since there is a specific event that you all have coming up, we'll just dive right into mentioning because it's not just a... I mean, sure, there may be some aspects of dust, but the fact of the matter is that it's still very much alive and well kind of thing. And so you have an event that's coming up here, the Border Archives Bazaar. So what is going to be going on with this event? Yeah, the Border Archives Bazaar is an event. Uh, it's sponsored by the Border Regional Archives Group, mm-hmm. which is kind of a loose organization, informal organization of people who work with archival materials in southern New Mexico, uh, the El Paso area, West Texas, northern Chihuahua, our friends down in Juarez. Um, and so we all work with these kinds of archival collections that you've been talking about. And uh, they're, they're in many different types of institutions, mm-hmm. uh, from academic archives, uh, such as where I work, public libraries, mm-hmm. such as Claudia, Claudia's uh, uh, workplace, and museums, government archives, county archives, religious archives. Uh, you know, there are archives all over the place. So uh, the Border Regional Archives Group is a way for us to sort of come together so that we know uh, about the collections that each other have and we're better able to serve the public, which is our ultimate goal is to get these uh, historical materials to the public. So that's the Border Regional Archives Group. And, and for the past, though, six years, I think, mm-hmm. I think this is the sixth. What, what does it say on the card there? Sixth annual or anyway, I think it's the sixth year. I don't think it's on that one okay. here. Again, put that up on screen here. The actual uh, flyer that you have yeah. for it. uh, uh uh, Puentes al Pasado, Bridges to the Past, but it will be coming up Saturday, October 22nd at the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To cut to the chase, yeah, uh, this event will be held at the Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum. And what we do is we have all of these organizations uh, bring materials from our collections, historical materials. Mm-hmm. We have tables set up. It's a free public event. Uh, anyone can come out and uh, people are able to interact with these historical materials. Uh, we talk about uh, the relationship between archives and history, right? Uh, and we talk a bit about the, the the history of the region as well. So that's a very important point that I want to stress here, because thinking about this as a you know fairly professional event, a lot of very important documents going to be on display and a part of it here that it is open to the public. It's not just for those that are you know deeply ingrained or in in depth on these issues. Anyone can come out and participate in it, much like we're showing here from uh, one of the previous events, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That the the whole reason for the event is to get the public out so that they can understand what archives are, what the importance of archives are and the work that archivists do. So on that note then I'd like to get y'all's perspective on it, being that you are 
very much involved with these. So again, starting with uh, you, Claudia, from again, my left to right, when it comes to archives, how do you even consider it? How do you go about then dealing with it and managing it? Well, to begin with, um, when it comes to managing archives, it's pretty much getting yourself organized. Um, I guess each institution has their own policies as to how they go about about doing so. Um, when it comes to acquiring specific materials, we all tend to have a pretty like scope that we focus on. So here at the El Paso Public Library, we do uh, focus on the El Paso region primarily, initially first, and then we do extend out to the entire Southwest region. Um, it's entirely about you know acquiring materials, processing materials, um, creating finding aids, creating inventories, access points where the public can um, can find out what it is that we have and how they go about um, accessing that material. So here at the El Paso Public Library, we do have a variety of resources that people can use. We have um, different inventories, indexes that people can can browse through to see what kind of information we have. Of course, um, they can reach out to us specifically because mm -hmm. some of these inventories are um, only on the back end where we have access to. Um, and so we can go ahead and assist them with that research and browse through our holdings to see what's available for them. Um, but it's a continuous work. It's continuous work. There's always mm -hmm. um, collections that need to be processed, that need to be gone through. Um, even some of the collections that we have that have had some sort of minimal processing, I can't, um, in all honesty, I can't say that we know exactly what is in every single box or every single file, you know. So that's why if you ever have any questions wanting to know what we may have available, I mean, just let us know and we'll do the dirty work and go through there, see, see what may be accessible to y'all and then, you know, give, uh, provide that information to you. Thing. I kind of asked my second question there about also talk a little about what specifically your organization that does. Again, talking about there with the El Paso Public Library, the Border Heritage Center. And then, of course, Sue, we've talked previously with you all at the New Mexico Museum of Space History and, of course, the Space Hall of Fame involved with it. But when it comes specifically to the archive work then, I mean, we've had some great archival pictures that we've pulled up previously. But, I mean, again, the actual preservation of both documents and then, well, a lot of artifacts that you also have in your collection up there, right? Exactly. We also have films, uh, 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter films, uh, even some 8 millimeter films. And in fact, we've been very lucky to have gotten a grant, two grants uh, this past year to digitize uh, the uh, films, about 15 special films uh, that are very rare. Uh, including those of, from the Gemini program, which mm -hmm. uh, there are not too many of that out there. Uh, we have photographs of the Manhai uh, program, which of course is pre-space program. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what was taking place at Holloman in the late 40s, early 50s. And we also have a lot of uh, Operation Paperclip uh, things, right. of, such as well, we have a, a lot of Werner von Braun's pictures, but uh, the one that you're looking at right now mm -hmm. is actually a photograph that was taken in 1950 in Chicago, Illinois, and here you have about seven of the Operation Paperclip scientists, and they are discussing at this meeting, special meeting, uh, what is going to become the International Space Station. So that was in 1950. So you can see how far back some of that goes. And that's what our archive is about. It's about anything and everything dealing with space history, including some prehistory, as in archaeological sites that uh, were used in the past uh, for stargazing and looking at the mm. sky. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, what has that got to do with modern space history? It has a lot actually, because a lot of scientists actually do go back to some of those earlier records. And, keep, of course, keeping of records is, again, one of the major purposes here. So I want to come back to you, Dennis, uh, before we hit that next break already and talk about, of course, you know, the stuff that is at the NMSU Library Archives, which may sound like probably out of the, you know, differences, the organizations we've got here, public library, specific museum library, but then, you know, university library. Um, I, I think that a consumption might be that you probably have one of the more expansive sets of stuff potentially here. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
Uh, that could be. I don't know. I don't know that we've ever compared the sizes <laughs> of our collections, but uh, we do have a, a fairly large collection, uh, and it, it both we have uh, materials from that that represent the history of the institution of the university going back to the very beginnings, uh, papers of Hiram Hadley, the founder of the college, and then we have what we call the Rio Grande Historical Collections, mm. which is more a, a community archives. These are materials that have been collected from throughout southern New Mexico. Our focus, as, as both Claudia and Sue mentioned, archives generally have a, a very specific scope or focus because mm. we can't collect everything in the world right. as much as we would like to. Uh, and so we have to have a focus to, to limit what we collect. And even mm. in that, the collections grow and grow, and 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 that's a, an image of, of some of our stacks. Um, right. Yeah. And... Um, so let's see. I lost my train of thought. Um, How you focus on it? Yeah, yeah. So the Rio Grande Historical Collections is filled with uh, these papers from Southern New Mexico and the U.S. Mexico border region, uh, and those include things like family papers. A, a large part uh, por portion of it are family papers, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, records of organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations like the League of Women Voters, things like that. Um, records of businesses that have been in existence in southern New Mexico, um, maybe a uh, 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 sawmill from from Mescalero from okay. the nineteenth century, something like that. Um, hotel registers from the nineteenth century, things like that. Um, and then uh, we we have a lot of materials, which uh, so those are mostly paper based materials. Mm. And then we also have materials that are in other formats. All of us do. Um, we were seeing some of the photographs from Sue's collection, but of course, we have photographs. Uh, all of our organizations generally have photographs, right? Um, audiovisual materials um, and other other kinds of materials like those. Yeah, it kind of seems in general that, except for maybe specific artifacts, that in general, the way I've seen it when I've had the chance to go through archives is that you know the further back you go it tends to be more you know written documentation and then you start getting into pictures and then into video and then into much more multimedia so to speak as you get into the age of things within the archives as more media has become available so the challenges essentially for archivists have continued to grow as more mediums more considerations and even just uh, I'm sure that there's uh, digital media that you all are having to contend with in nowadays I think the phrase was put to me essentially that if you want to consider all written and produced and still available in some format uh, human works created like pre-digital could now be is have been widely outstripped by what has been created since essentially the advent of the computer and maybe even a little bit before that uh, it's uh it's not even a competition if you put it on a scale you'd flip the scale over one way over the other ver modernity versus antiquity not that there are few works coming from antiquity but it's just it's continued on and so and that's part of kind of what you're all going to be getting to again with the bazaar about also people bringing in their documents so people wanting to get involved with that and i mean it, getting beyond even the scope discussion we're talking about here just for the event again that's coming up uh, a little bit later here in october what do people need to know what should they bring or what do you all expect what do you hope happens well, we're hoping that uh, we get people to come visit us mm -hmm. uh, at the bazaar, and uh, we've been talking about it might end up being sort of like an antiques roadshow, where we're going to be live streamed, and if people want to bring us some of their documents that they have, and have somebody take a look at it, and to mm -hmm. see, uh, is this something that would be uh, useful for your collection, uh, maybe we can uh, make a digital copy of it for you and if they want to come and say you know I have all these papers that have been gathering dust in, in my attic uh, can I donate them to you and I'm sure all three of us here would say yeah yeah, yeah uh, because we, we <laughs> like to have collections so okay that's uh, a little bit of the detail on what is going to coming up here again uh, that's sue taylor chief curator of the new mexico museum of space history also joining us here in studio are claudia ramirez the library archivist with the el paso public Ri library border heritage center of course dennis daly as well department head for the new mexico library archives we've got to take that first break of the hour right now but coming out of this talk a little bit more about the event the archives and what will be going on with it here so stay tuned more on the el paso history radio show after this break here on news radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archive radio programs. 
The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, there are many ways that you can tune in to us. We are the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook. You can go there for our weekly promo announcements on the topics of the program each and every week. Also, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, where you can find the El Paso Gold DVD series from Capstone Production, covering more than the last couple of decades of history production in town in terms of documentary producing and of course of course the full series of the el paso history tv segments that aired on kvia recently all uploaded for free for your viewing pleasure plus a reminder to support some of our advertisers pepe's restaurant in kenya Tio. of course in open for in-house dining at 6761 donovan drive basically just a little bit south of donovan and talbot So 6761 Donovan Drive, give them a call at 915-877-2152, 915-877-2152. It is the home of the Juan and only Margarita and the continuation on of the old Griggs recipes, including if you ever had a good time in their front room and all of their curios and uh, oddities. They got them all, or at least a lot of them there. So go and check them out and find those great recipes. But uh, speaking of not exactly curios and relics in its own way, we are joined here by a representation of a wide swath of different archival organizations here in town. Again, Claudio Ramirez, library archivist with the El Paso Public Library Border Heritage Center. Sue Taylor, chief curator of the New Mexico Museum of Space History. And Dennis Daly, department head of the NMSU Library Archives. Again, all focusing on an upcoming event in which a lot of this will be on showcase, or at least the top topics and the complexities within them again with the border archives bazaar coming up saturday october 22nd and uh so we were talking during the break that beyond of course the yeah, antiques roadshow kind of thing or people bring it out archives being able to look at what they have what might be possible to be preserved those kind of things and of course what you already have that will be on display you're also gonna have speakers coming out during it right that's true i'll let dennis speak to that a little bit more yeah, sure. Um, one of the popular portions of the Archives Bazaar has been in the past that, that we have a speaker series. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have people come talk about topics related to the history of the region. Uh, it's generally people who have done uh, extensive research in the archives in the region. And mm-hmm. so they talk about not only the results of their research, but also about the process of doing research in archives. And uh, we're the, the speakers this year are still being formed, but we have a few people uh, already uh, on board. Uh, Dr. Jamie Bronstein, who teaches history at NMSU, mm-hmm. uh, will be there presenting on some of her research that she's done on uh, uh, Chicano civil rights movements mm-hmm. in southern New Mexico uh, in the 1960s. 
uh, which a lot of a lot of that was focused in the universities, Western New Mexico University, sure. NMSU, and Eastern New Mexico University. Um, and we will have uh, Dr. Rick Hendricks, who former state historian for the state of New Mexico, will be talking about uh, some of his research that he's done in the archives as well. Excellent. So it won't just be, again, hands-on, but also be presentations, again, as we've had kind of those uh, pictures up from previous years of when you've been having these events. And I should mention that uh, we'll also be showing some of the, uh, Sue mentioned some historic films, we'll be oh, uh, excellent. Uh, showing some historic films from several of the repositories as well, which is always fun to see those old old movies, some being, you know, amateur homemade right. films, and then some being I'm sure the ones Sue has were produced by the federal government, and so it's, it's quite a range. It's always interesting to get a different perspective, and it can often be fascinating to find that through the sands of time and through the shifting focuses of history, what may have seemed entirely mundane and ordinary at any point in time, even on the in the era of film, can now be a fascinating moment of wondering, of, of finding out, oh, so that's what things looked like, worked like, those kind of things at this point. And, I mean, just some of the examples of, I'm coming to mind of how that can then be used even in modern and popular culture was like for, say, the show Mad Men, how they went back to archives and found the color palettes of the appliances of that point in time. But to do that kind of work took things such as archives where that was noted down. So even the most minute and even seemingly inane details can be ultimately very useful when it comes to, I mean, of course, we're talking about media production there, but in terms of, you know, historical research, finding out about how things work. So that's part of the importance of what you all will have on display as part of all this. And why probably seeing those historic films, even some of the home ones will probably be very interesting coming up for this. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, again, um, that's Dennis Daly speaking there. Again, joined also by Sue Taylor and Claudio Ramirez of the NMSU Library Archives, New Mexico Museum of Space History, and El Paso Public Library, respectively. we got to take that next break right now. But coming out of this break, we'll talk more about some of these specific organizations and, again, the focuses that you all have and how this will kind of work with the event coming up. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano, and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140, for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. 
Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish mission. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, I have to mention some of our other great partners in promoting different aspects of El Paso history. And with other events coming up, you want to make sure to check out celebrationofourmountains.org. Again, they're shorter one, Celeb M. TNS, but search Celebration of Our Mountains and you'll probably find it on there. Many different events going on coming up, including the one uh, already going on at this point today, the Thousand Steps Hikeathon, but other ones that are, of course, coming up on their uh, long list of them, including the Sunrise at Scenic Drive event and art programming, the Dripping Springs History Hike, and uh, some of El Paso's oldest rock stores on Trans Mountain. So check all that and a whole lot more events going on through the end of the year and I believe beyond at this point. So check out what they got going on. And again, uh, there are many events with some of the other guests we've had on the program talking about their upcoming events. Again, all that celebration of our mountains. Dot org. And, of course, our friends at Monterey Asset Management have changed their name to M1EP Management Corporation. The website now, m1ep.com. That's m number one epcom Give them a call at 915-592-4549. But, again, joining us here in studio right now, as we're talking about marking of history in a different and entirely very important kind of way, we're talking about archives and the many facets of them. We're going to join here in studio from my left to right, Claudia Ramirez, library archivist with the El Paso Public Library Border Heritage Center, Sue Taylor, chief curator of the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Dennis Daly, the department head of the New Mexico Library Archives. Again, thank you all very much for being here with us in studio today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, all of this focused on the upcoming uh, Border Bazaar. Border Archives Bizarre, to say the actual full name of it there. Again, coming up Saturday, October 22nd. But I uh, want to take a moment to delve into some of the specifics that you all, at the very least, are dealing with and are probably going to want to be seeing during this event. So if people had specific questions about what they might be able to see, what you all are going to be bringing out, or what might be relevant to your specific archives, we're going to delve, spend some time delving into each of y'all's individual archives. So we'll go ahead and start from, again, my left to right. So, Claudia, when it comes to the Border Heritage Center for the El Paso Public Library, I mean, I think the, you know, the age and the importance of the El Paso Public Library's archives is, is not, wouldn't be too much of a stretch to imagine for anyone who is, hasn't even been there. I mean, you think about <laughs> libraries and how much they hold there, you'd be pretty well on track. But the specific organization, the, specifically the Border Heritage Center, again, you mentioned a little bit about the focus there, but mm -hmm. uh, we do have some specific examples of the kind of archives you all have, right? Yes. Yes, I brought a few little samples here for you all to see. So, so in general, again, what the things that you all focus on with your, again, locations that's actually separate from the main branch of the library is on a lot of, well, it, it honestly, it takes a lot of different forms of I mean, just the four different things, uh, pictures that we have available here. So both physical artifacts, um, drawings, photographs, photographs, diaries, maps, yes, yeah. uh -huh, diaries, papers, manuscripts, business ledgers, business documents. We just have a, a variety of materials there at the at the center. And of course all that about of course, you know, many aspects of what is documented about, you know, regional history, both mm -hmm. local and kind of the surrounding and even beyond because I mean some of these uh, uh pictures that you got of our of locations even in uh, technically other states that or a couple states over, right? Yes. So this photo right here is of Hill Street School, which is actually located in Globe, Arizona. Mm. And this photo is part of the Ponsford Trost collection that we have. So um, I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with Henry Trost, famed mm -hmm. um, Southwest architect here. And so, yes, I mean, Trost not only um, designed several buildings here in El Paso, but he's, um, his, presence is, his presence is evident all throughout New Mexico, Arizona, West Texas. And so I just brought this photo just to kind of illustrate that, you know, when we have um, people reach out to us when they're looking to do preservation work, when they're mm -hmm. looking to restore old historic buildings. And so the Ponsford Trolls collection is heavily used all the time by um, contractors, architects, researchers throughout the Southwest. Because, of course, those references, the points of like... Um 
particularly since I know in El Paso, downtown El Paso specifically, as there's been much discussion going on of the historic buildings, and we're not going to totally get into that right now, but in some cases when it's been discussed about preservation or, you know, if it's worth preserving, oftentimes what it originally looked like compared mm-hmm. to how it has been moved to has been a very important point. So that's at least one example of, again, how archives can be used and how they can be have an impact on what's happening right now. Yes, yes, definitely. So when it comes to then the scope, because, I mean, it, it's, it kind of sounds like you, you might not be faulted for thinking that this archive is basically everything that could be connected to El Paso in a way. Or, or how do you all consider, particularly, again, your specific uh, part of it, the Border Heritage Center? Well, with Border Heritage, our mission is to acquire, uh, make, preserve, and make accessible materials relating to the history and culture of El Paso and the surrounding Southwest region. And like I, I specified before, while we do concentrate on El Paso, we do also know the importance um, of what, ty- what, what materials play from New Mexico, Arizona, northern Chihuahua, which is our geographic scope that we, that mm-hmm. we tend to concentrate on. Um, and so we pretty much just kind of think, what's the importance? Um, I know that you were going to ask later on about we, d- we can't accept everything. Yeah, of course. We, we, have to, we have to make some tough decisions. Um, but um, if, if we find some inherent value in these materials that we know people will find useful in the future, we will try to make um, their acquisition possible. Okay. So, again, it's kind of a you know it when you see it kind of thing as opposed to like kind a of, hard and fast rule. Kind of a thing. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes we actually get some, um, we, we get inquiries about, about donations, but the material may be duplicates. We may already have something hmm. that's similar. Um, we have a very a, a very good um, high school yearbook collection, which is very popular. Huh, and okay. actually, we're always reaching out to try and get more of those. But we have a few copies that we have the same year of, you know, city directories are very, are, are very instrumental in genealogy mm-hmm. and historical mm-hmm. research. We have tons of, of city directories. A- at the, there will come a point where we're like, we can't accept any more city directories. There's just not enough shelf space to hold them. But because they are so popular and they get so heavily used, there's a lot of wear and tear on them. So we know that in time, we're going to have to replace an old beat up copy with another one. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of the big balancing act, not even just between space, but also between use yes. and yes. what it takes to make sure archives can still be accessible. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So we've got, again, some of the more physical aspects of it. I mean, a lot of physical archives, of course, but beyond just, uh, you know, papers and documents, you even have things such as, uh, well, what, what would you describe this at, what we're looking at on screen right so now? So those are actually two um, United Farm Workers buttons that were used during the, 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 the Chicano movement, the farm workers movement. And I believe it's titled as the Nosotros Venceremos, like we will mm-hmm. persevere. And actually, those two, if you're interested in, in viewing those, you can head on over to the El Paso History Museum because they're actually on exhibit there with their Chicano Movement exhibit that they currently have going on. So another way that we assist people is we assist our local um, um, history committee, you know, museums, um, historical societies, when, they, when they put on exhibits or special programs, um, they reach out to us to see what kind of materials we may have to help supplement their work. Absolutely, because, of course, I mean, history museums on their own, while they can often have a lot of stuff, I mean, Sue, is in your case, uh, I mean, particularly for a lot of other ones, they may not have necessarily archive space, but they still want to, you know, put things out and find it here. So archives, so whether they have it or not, are still kind of instrumental for how it can be displayed then. And that's so it mm-hmm. like what you'd all do a lot of work with, with particularly, you know, El Paso museums. Right. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, we have very limited space, so we may be able to put on a, a small display, but a lot of our materials are kept in storage in our reference room. So we don't have the opportunity to display as, as much as we would like. So um, it's a limited situation to work with museums. You know, it's, um, our materials are displayed, the public gets to see them, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they're, they're seen in a broader, bigger picture. Which is why, again, the organizations may have to be connected about, you know, museums and archives, but they ultimately serve very different purposes because yes. one is meant for the kind of, you know, displaying and chronicling and making it accessible. And the other is making sure it's preserved and mm-hmm. still going to be available for potential future display mm-hmm. or use, et cetera, that kind of way. Yes. So I at least want to mention at least one other item that you got, do have in the archive there that you uh, brought a picture of, including uh, this one of a uh, particular album. Yes, this is, I believe his, his name was E.S. Pluck, and this is just a photo album of Chihuahua, Mexico in 1904. And I just brought this guy out to also demonstrate, while we do have 
collections that are fairly large, like the Ponsford Trust Collection, where mm -hmm. we have thousands of architectural drawings and hundreds of documentary photographs. We also have collections that are made up of individual items that we've sort of placed together. So this one, I believe, is going to be part of like the Southwest Collection. Um, and of course, so it, it documents um, Mr. Plug's journey through Chihuahua, Mexico in 1904. And I think looking at that picture on the right here, it's a little small, a little bit faded from this mm -hmm. view, but that looks very much like... That the, is the, the Guadalupe Yeah, the Guadalupe. Church, yes, the uh, mission in, over there. In, uh, in Juarez. Downtown Juarez, uh -huh. absolutely. So, again, some fascinating pictures and parts of that. And, of course, that is part of what will be on display during the upcoming event, the uh, Border Archives Bazaar. But we'll talk more about that in the coming segment as well. Again, speaking right here has been uh, Claudia Ramirez, Library Archivist with the El Paso Public Library Border Heritage Center. Also, again, joining us in studio here is Sue Taylor, Chief Curator of the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Dennis Daly, the Department Head of the Anime. SU Library, uh, Library Archives. We haven't forgot about them, but we'll be talking more about each individual organization here a bit. But we've got to take that next break right now, so stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archive radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. I have to mention some of our other great partners and talking about different aspects of El Paso's history in many different ways, including, of course, Rick Kern's music podcast, Talk and Rock Radio, delving into kind of the modern music history, a lot of stuff he was involved in, in kind of the golden age of rock and roll, and the bands coming out from El Paso. Of course, that history does continue on, but if you want to go to talkandrockradio.com, he has some of his remembrances, some of the more recent ones, including uh, uh, Carl Glamercy and the Buckinghams, uh, Gary Puckett and Un the Union Gap, including the Border Legends of El Paso tour that 
that, uh, again, himself, Rick Kern, was involved in a production of and I got to have a hand in for a few years. But in any case, TalkinRockRadio.com is where you can find that. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we do have uh, Claudia Ramirez with El Paso Public Library Border Heritage Center, Sue Taylor with the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Dennis Daly with the NMSU Library Archives. Again, talking all about the upcoming event that is going to be happening a little bit later here in October with the Border Archives Bazaar at the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum, Saturday, October 22nd. And so during that event, as we have some of the previous pictures that uh, Dennis shared with us of uh, what the event looked like and the speakers and things going through it, of course, people bringing out archives, being able to handle them will be a part of it, but also the potential for them to see if something is of... Uh, kind of what you mentioned there, Sue, about the not not quite Antiques Roadshow, because I think that's trademarked, so you're not going to call it that, but that kind of thing, and the possibility, that experience will be a part of it here. So, Claudia, going back to you then, when it comes to what specifically people might have that you might be looking for, if there's any, like, uh, this might be a good moment as well to say, if there's something that you've been particularly looking for that you have a suspicion that someone may have out in their closet that's moved from, like, six previous houses or, you know, uh, ancestors cleared out of, you know, their previous homes. Is anything they're particularly looking for that would be more relevant than not that people might be holding on to they may not realize the importance of? Oh, gee, let's see. That might um, be kind of a you know existential question, I understand. Yeah, that, that that's a bit tough. But, you know, when it comes to personal family papers, um, I can say that, you know, if you happen to have letters, correspondence of perhaps of a, of a particular time frame or perhaps there was correspondence between family members as to certain events that may have happened here in El Paso or the surrounding region that are pretty historically significant just so we can get an idea as to what their mindset was at the time the context of, mm-hmm. of what was going on back then I mean those you, people may not think that those are important but that's exactly what researchers are looking for when when they're writing about you know what may have happened back then um, so, so those might be of interest. Um, I know I already pitched the the local high school yearbooks, and I, I keep <laughs> saying that because it is such a popular collection, and you get such good information out of that. You know, besides genealogy type of historical information, um, going back to your reference about Mad Men and how people know what what time yeah. periods are, what they were like. High school yearbooks are perfect for that. There's plenty of photographs in there. We get to see what was happening back back then, what the fashion was like, what clubs were, were going out, what um, big historical significant events happened throughout the year. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're full of really cool information. Absolutely. So those kind of things, I mean, again, mundane details can be surprisingly important. One other example that comes to mind here that is kind of one of the frustrations of a lack of archival resources in history I'm aware of is that uh, in European like uh, condiment traditions that there was obviously salt and pepper, but there was a third pot that something went in, but there's not a lot of documents and details on what went in there because of course everyone knows what goes in the third pot why would why would you write that down <laughs> but it's been lost to time and so it's good it's probably in some dusty old tome that no one has thought to look through that will detail that and it will make someone's career when they are finally able to write about that's what it was we finally like they think it's mustard but they have no there's no <laughs> clear idea if it actually was or not so that's the kind of thing that was so mundane at the time no one th- who would write that about that now that that's so it'll be like writing about uh you know the, the specifics of toilet paper and yet in the future 100 <laughs> years from now that may be or again from the more kind of modern sense about uh eggs all of our recipes reference eggs but if there could be sometimes you know millennia from now when thinking about what were they what what eggs were they using because it wasn't sp- who would write about of course we all know it's chicken eggs but someone in the future <laughs> may think that uh what were they using what, what kind of eggs were these were they ostrich eggs i mean they were big enough right and just they were in zoos everywhere so of course it must like that kind of conversation and that's again i'm using extreme <laughs> examples but those are the kind of mundane details that can be very important for getting historical perspective right Yes, yes. And I I will say this, um, if you happen to have any types of materials, any type of um, perhaps, you know, business documents, documents with medical history, with really extreme personal information, we will have to have further uh, conversations, discussions, because um, when it comes to personal information, we just do not want to have that material lying about and accessible for anybody and anyone to take a look at. So um, if you happen to have material that may be of a little bit more um private or, or or i don't know how to say it um D- detailed personal information or what we might yeah. call from the modern standpoint personally identifiable information Beta. pii yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. 
yeah, we'll, we'll need to discuss that even further, you know. And, you know, donors are able, uh, we, we have discussions with them. They may want to put certain restrictions on their materials as well. So it's not just a matter of fact that we get something and it's going to be readi readily accessible the next day. No. For, I mean, first we'll have to go ahead, accept it, process it, and then depending on whatever um, stipulations were agreed upon, you know, we'll, we'll move forward from then. Absolutely here. So, of course, um, all of this is going to be on uh, display, at least a good chunk of it, during the upcoming uh, Border Archives Bazaar. And just as a further note here, this is not a document shredding or disposal service. No. So <laughs> if you got, uh, like I am moving house, have now gathered up a number of years worth of bills that we got electronically anyway, so we just never bothered to open, like, sure, they are getting into history with them i mean 10 years old in some cases that does not mean it's something that y'all want no 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 sorry no we won't take your your old gas bills no <laughs> no so again not all uh, just because it's printed doesn't mean it's important mm -hmm. or significant for this kind of way so you know, just no this is not the place to come and get your uh offload your boxes of i don't know what to do with these papers yes <laughs> At least have a thought about how they might be useful to someone else because people uh, try, yeah. people try, but no, no. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, again, uh, that's Claudia Ramirez, library archivist with the El Paso Public Library's Border Heritage Center. And again, also joined here in studio by Sue Taylor, chief curator of the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Dennis Daly, the department head of the NMSU Library Archives. Got to take that next break right now and get back to the top of the hour. But coming out of this, we'll of course talk more about each of y'all's organizations and the many different aspects within them. So, of course, a uh, Stay tuned here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Back in a minute. Don't go anywhere. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140. For souvenirs, gifts, and decor, Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 
20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail, plus the Guadalupe mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com. M numeral one EP.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. We're going to be talking more about the, the Border Regional Archives Group and, of course, their upcoming event, the Border Archives Bazaar, coming up a little bit later in October. But we're starting hour two of the program as we usually do with a history moment from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk. Start talking about today about the Franklin Mountains and their history. El Paso has the highest elevation of any Texas city. The tallest peak of our Franklin Mountains is 7,192 feet, making El Paso the top of Texas when it comes to city elevations. In fact, no other Texas city comes even close. For example, Lubbock's elevation is about 3,300 feet, Midlands is close to 2,800 feet, San Antonio is 662 feet above sea level, and Dallas is barely 430 feet above sea level. There is a higher point in El Paso in Texas. It's Guadalupe Peak out on the Carlsbad Highway, standing at over 8,700 feet, but it is not in a city. So, El Paso is the top of Texas when you measure Texas cities. On old maps, you can find the peak of North Mount Franklin noted at 7,200 feet, not the current 7,192 feet. So why the eight foot difference? Before the Franklins became a state park, they were private property. A man named Dick Knapp bought the mountain all the way from the New Mexico state line south to Trans Mountain Road, which included North Mount Franklin. Knapp was a developer who planned to lease out the top of the mountain to communications companies that needed the higher elevations for their transmitters. Knapp had a road carved up the west side of the mountain to the top of North Mount Franklin. There he bulldozed the peak flat for future buildings, and that took eight feet off the elevation. His building plans never materialized, and the land became part of Franklin Mountain State Park. The 24,000-acre park is inside El Paso city limits, making it the largest urban park in the United States, and El Paso can still claim to be the top of Texas. I'm Jackson Polk with this History Moment for the El Paso History Radio Show. Also mentioned for some of our further great partners in promoting different aspects of El Paso history, of course, the great Facebook group, Remember in El Paso When, our Barbara Given Baney, the operator there, uh, they do great work with their own archive pictures, digitally in this case, and post it up there. And of course, they do a lot of research, including some of these uh, other archives we're talking about physically today. But this group specifically, 33,000 members, and it's no mean feat to keep such a large group of our individuals on track. So remember, the admins have worked hard in doing their own research involving the pictures with our history attached. So if you're going to share or use their pictures, please give credit to them. And of course, Chief Admin Owner and Historian Barbara Given Baney has 
affectionately known as BGB. Also admins Rick Duncan, Rick Nahara, Margaret D. Smith, and moderators Ben Vincent and Al Lowe. Again, check them out again. Remember in El Paso when the Facebook group where you can also see our promo announcements and these programs posted just about every week. But again, joining us here in studio, we do of course joined by Claudio Ramirez, library archivist with the El Paso Public Library, Border Heritage Center, Sue Taylor, chief curator with the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Dennis Daly, the department head of the New Mexico Library Archive, NMSU, rather library archives so a lot of physical archives we're talking about here but you all do some presentations and things with it so it's not just physical people can see it but of course what we're talking about with that upcoming event again the border archives bizarre that will be happening a little bit later here in october on october 22nd at the new mexico farm and ranch uh, heritage museum will be one of the ways people can really go out and get literally their hands on some of what's coming there so that'll be kind of an exciting event and one that uh I hope I can make it out, too. We often have demands here at the studio at the station. But, I mean, I, I, I definitely like getting my hands on being able to see and experience history in this win. I'm sure that's part of the reason it appeals to y'all as well, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's why it appeals to the public so well. So much. Yes. Yeah. Because it often may, again, feel like, well, it's, you know, stuffy away and you have to have, you know, requirements or expectations about how you go in and deal with it. And some of that may be more true than not in certain cases. But, you know, the accessibility and the availability of it is kind of really one of the more important aspects that you all encounter daily. Because it's one thing to have perfectly preserved documents that are kept locked away, sealed away, and no one can ever touch because you've kind of then removed half the purpose of it. Like, sure, there are some overwhelming ones that, like, you know, original copies of the Constitution, Dead Sea Scrolls, where, like, handling of them, yes, can make them no longer available for future generations, but preservation and accessibility kind of go hand in hand for a lot of what it seems that you all deal with, it seems like, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, most archives exist to provide this information for researchers. That's that's the ultimate goal for most of us. There there are there is some variation. Some archives are a little more private than others, but but I think all of archives are, are our archives are, are public archives. Anyone can come in and use them. Of course, particularly as you all have a lot of public institutions that you are both involved with and, and uh, you know, responsive to. So I want to get more into some of the specifics on them. So, Sue, specifically with the New Mexico Museum of Space History that, and, of course, the Space Hall of Fame, as we have talked previously with well, y'all's administration, directors and such, and the events that have come in coming up with it, one kind of the underlying factors is most of the stuff that we've talked about previously on this program and in previous years, the underpinning supporting that has essentially been the work that you do specifically with the archives because the again the kind of that uh, both museum and archive combo to so supporting organizations but that have entirely different purposes one is to display and the other is to make sure it's on hand so not exactly going to call it the warehouse in the showroom but it's closer than not at least for the common conception of one is keeping it all in place and one is other other ways making it look good so people can come and see it and again it all takes having the stuff which is essentially a major part of what you do right that is as uh, the curator, the library and archives also fall under my purview. And it's important that one of the things that we're trying to do now is get as many of the documents digitized as possible right. because that will make them even more accessible on the web page. Uh, people can link to our web page, and if they're looking for a particular document, they might be able to find it that way. Uh, for example, we have a report uh, that was done for uh, the Apollo 1 accident. And wow. that's one of the things that people may wish to go through that. And rather than have them handle it, uh, because uh, people's hands and everything do have chemicals mm -hmm. and dirt and whatever, you know, by making it digitally available, they can then read that report and get more of the specifics. The same thing with the... Uh, Challenger exhibit uh, or Challenger accident and the Columbia accident as well. We have those reports. Because, yeah, of course, holding on to, of course, obviously very important things like that makes right. a lot of sense for the future. And uh, I mean, even for the current moment we're seeing of space travel, of, you know, the uh, the billionaire space races, we been oftentimes called. <laughs> I mean, they, of course, have their own challenges. We've seen, you know, accidents and setbacks happen in those programs. So being able to go back and reference, okay, what has been previous challenges? previous challenges found even though the technology may be wildly different in its implementation a lot of similar things i mean air is air and getting to the 
boundary between air and space can be very similar. So that's why things like this is not even just a historical curiosity, but can be rel- very relevant to modern challenges. Exactly. Artemis is still trying to get off the ground, literally. So uh, as they are researching, they're being a lot more careful now than they were in the early years of NASA because they were on a timeline at that point. Mm-hmm. Now, it's if they think something is not going to work quite right, even though this is an unmanned space flight, they want to make sure that the technology works and that it is going to go off without a hitch. And if there's anything that looks like it won't, they're going to nix it until they have it uh, really going spot on. Yeah, phrase of uh, hindsight is twenty twenty often applies right. to, oh, well, I wish I'd known that before I go into it. And that's why, again, archives can serve as a good way to, uh, you know, sharpen that focus, get closer to that twenty twenty by saying, okay, what exactly were some of the previous challenges and how were they handled? And so to that point, you have some very interesting examples of some of those previous experiences, including with some of the uh, research programs in their own right that you have uh, the archival pictures of, right? Yes, uh, we have quite a few researchers that come to our archive. They make an appointment. They come in, and just recently we've had someone come in who is doing some research on the primate program uh, that was taking place at chimpanzee uh, space chimps at uh, Holloman Air Force Base for the Holloman Air Medical. That first picture was of Enos, who was the second space uh, chimp to go up after Ham. This one here. Yes, but everybody thinks about Ham. They forget about Enos, you know. Mm -hmm. He he was kind of the serious one. This is Ham, who totally lived up to his name, his Mm -hmm. nickname. And here he is relaxing, taking a a break between his trainings. Uh, And he went through some pretty intense trainings. We have, actually, on exhibit, you see here... uh, not so much the chair. We had to re- uh, make a reproduction of that. But the board that he's working on where he actually was practicing the uh, type of uh, hmm. movements that he would be doing, you know, following the lights and, and seeing what he would have to do. We have two of those original ones, and, and they're on exhibit right now. In but our it, museum. But, of course, it takes having it on hand to be able to then put it out on exhibit. And, of course, the archival photos such as these make mm-hmm. it very possible to do, say, the reproductions and the proper demonstration of it. Because uh, another example that comes up here about, um, shall we say, in times before there were photos available of it, uh, there's often the misconception about how antiquity looked, all, you know, white marble and very clean looking where as if we had archival photos from that time, you know, and anachronisms be damned, uh, we would have known that at that point in time that they were, I mean, historical evidence has shown that they were fairly garishly painted, like very bright, like it was kind of a, yes, brightness at all costs and stark contrast. So that's why having these kind of things in the modern sense, of course, is very important for making sure the context is kept correctly. We have, as I said, not only those objects, but we have the documentation uh, that Dr. Stapp was keeping, you know, of the entire uh, CHIMP program and uh, all the statistics mm-hmm. that they needed, such as uh, Colonel John Paul Stapp is also known as the fastest man in the world, but here right. he is on Sonic Wind 1, and it is partly due to his research that they uh, learned about the G-forces that might be uh, affecting the astronauts mm-hmm. eventually, and... Um, even to the use of seat belts that he worked right. with the Chrysler Corporation, which is why we all now have seat belts, is because of him. Yeah, and again, you you have a particular set of challenges with your archives, and I'm using archives in a very broad sense here as well, because there's the whole rocket park that, I mean, falls under your purview as well, that's yes. at the base of around here, and including, I mean, you have a version of this, one of the sleds that's still out there on the grounds, right? Well, we had the Sonic Wind, ah, which, okay. which is the original. It was on loan to us for the past uh, 10 years or so from the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian decided to do a new exhibit called Speed with opening ah, okay. up their uh, new exhibits. So um, they took that away from us, and uh, that was really a sad day. But uh, in exchange, uh, we now have a, a the Mercury uh, 7 backup capsule oh, okay so it's it and it, it's sitting right now in our warehouse uh because it's awaiting we have to build a new building to be, be able to house it 
and exhibit it. But that was the exchange they gave us, which is, okay, fine. Uh, we, we can go with that. But we really want Sonic Wind 1 back. I mean, I remember going out and seeing parts of that ever since, you know, growing up and going yeah. visiting there with, like, Boy Scout trips and that kind of thing. And, again, the many aspects of the Rocket Park. So that's, I mean, a challenge of the part of their archive you have. But, again, even with some of the examples you've got, such as I believe this is uh, from the new Mercury 7 um, at the right. Loveless Space Center there dealing with and showing some of the ways you're even doing the preservation on it with the ruler there at the bottom, keeping it uh, yes. in shape and intact, that kind of stuff. Yes, this this is a photograph that was taken of the... Uh, initial Mercury astronauts after they had just finished their exams at the Loveless Medical Center in Albuquerque. And what's so neat about this particular photo is not only was it presented to Randy Loveless, but we have his uh, the signatures, the autographs mm -hmm. of the astronauts. And uh, it's going to be hard to see here, but if you look up, uh, you have people looking out the windows uh, from the medical center you know, seeing, ooh, what's going on down there? Mm, mm -hmm. So that actually brings it a little bit more down to the personal. So this this is a very special picture that we have. And it, people, if somebody comes into the archive and they want to see it, we can actually show that to them. Now, we may not let them handle it, but let's right. say they want to use it for a school project or something like that. We have it digitized, and they can use that. Excellent here. So again, that's Sue Taylor, the chief curator for the New Mexico Museum of Space History. Also joining us here in studio are Dennis Daly, the department head of the NMSU Library Archives, and Claudio Ramirez, the library archivist with the El Paso Public Library Border Heritage Center. Got to take that next break right now, but coming out of this break, more on some of the specific archival challenges that uh, you encounter there, Sue, as well as uh, the way you'll be demonstrating and accepting things during the upcoming event, the uh, Border Archives Bazaar. So uh, staying tuned for more talk, for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break, here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archive radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archive pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelray.com, 915-440-2140, for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral -one, one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, 
El Paso History TV. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, I want to tell you about what we got coming up for you next week on the program. Going to be talking about some of the tours upcoming for the UTEP campus, but in a very particular way, of course, we are in the midst of spooky season. So, we're going to be talking about the haunted campus tour, as well as, of course, the history that underpins and underlies all of it and the history of campus to a large extent. So, t- stay tuned for that next week here on the program. Of course, one more sponsor to remind you about as well, Mission Del Rey Southwest. Go there for out-of-town visitors for their great selection of many different souvenir, gifts, decor items, and even food stuff, the literal flavor of the Southwest. They're often restocked and often have some surprising things in stores. I'm often finding something that I did not expect to find out there, including they have a great selection of a cast aluminum patio furniture right now. I know I wasn't expecting it either, but it makes a lot of sense. It looks beautiful, whatever your decor is, and it's not cast iron, so it won't crush your foot quite as bad should it fall over so again find them of course on their twelve thousand square foot showroom at lee trevino and pelicano find them also online at missiondelray.com shipping worldwide got a whole shipping center ready to take your order of wherever you may need it but of course mention the el paso history radio show when visiting them for a discount or give them a call at 915-440-2140 that's 915-440-2140 but back here again in studio talking about archives and the many different aspects of them including what's going to be on exhibit for the upcoming event with the border archives bazaar uh talking again with uh claudia ramirez with the el paso public library dennis daly with the nmsu library archives and again sue taylor with the new mexico museum of space history again there's different challenges for each of y'all's organization but sue specifically again the fact that you got the missile park and the many different and differently sized physical objects to deal with that's led to uh, some of y'all's challenges both with documents of course in terms of having the space to keep a hold of all of this right oh most definitely and uh we have been outgrowing our collections building uh as we've been adding to it we're getting uh, more documents we're getting more magazines we're getting books we're getting uh reports uh Mm -hmm. right now we have about ten thousand documents from what we call the Connolly collection Hmm. which is uh dealing with all the nasa uh specs and everything uh Hmm. from the space program so Yes, and then we have uh, the uh, one of the um, we have a Mercury Seven backup uh, capsule that we now right. have on loan from the Smithsonian, which we can't exhibit at the moment because we cannot get it into the main museum building, and we a little big, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> so it's 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 sitting in in our warehouse, uh, which by the way does look like the last scene of the Raiders <laughs> of the Lost Ark if you were to go in there. Okay, but uh, we have a a hope that we'll be able to get a new building so we can exhibit that amongst many other artifacts that cannot be seen outside and cannot be uh, put into the main building. So that's that's one of the uh, projects uh, coming up here in the uh, not-too-distant future. Yeah, pesky so, things like doorways and uh, space capsules not fitting, fitting through them, I'm sure, is a bit of a frustration. At least a couple more pictures I wanted to show from the uh, documents you brought here was, again, from the Man High project, the thing right. that really, really kind of just predated um, the true space part of the space program as we know it. Right. A lot of people don't know about the Man High program. It was a uh, high-altitude balloon program. And uh, the first picture that you saw there, that was uh, Lieutenant Clifford McClure. Uh, he was one of the, they didn't call them astronauts back then, mm-hmm. uh, but he, he was one of the people that uh, went through the program uh, sitting in a capsule so when he would go up to a certain altitude they were making records what was exactly uh his feels feelings you know what was his respiratory like uh respiration his heart the whole nine yards to see how is altitude going to eventually affect the astronauts who are going to be going extremely you know out of out of the uh, suborbital and and beyond uh, the Earth's orbit. Uh, this is one of the uh, instruments that uh, we have because we have a complete record uh, documentation and photographs of what was taking place with the Man High program, including statistics. And it's because mm-hmm. of that documentation that 
uh, PBS was able to use our archive for their program called Spaceman. And that was really kind of exciting for us because even they didn't know some of the uh, pictures mm-hmm. there. So And so, of course, this is the kind of stuff that you will also have, you know, on, in, on exhibit, so to speak, during the upcoming event with the yes. Border Archives Bazaar, right? Exactly. That uh, newspapers of that with front page headlines of uh, when uh, the Apollo landings on the moon and trying to show a little bit of some of the different uh, newspaper clippings mm-hmm. that uh, may not deal exactly with Apollo, but may be dealing with adjunct of some of the personal lives of the astronauts. Uh, having some of the photographs uh, might even have the uh, Life magazine out that was autographed by mm. some of the astronauts, too, uh, along with other uh, interesting things, I always like to say. I, I like to haul out things that we have in the archive that don't necessarily make it onto the exhibit floor. Okay. So that's that's one of the things that makes this bazaar so extremely interesting and fun is because we can haul out this stuff. We can say, mm-hmm. hey, did you know we have this? And, oh, you're doing research for El Paso History Day? And, oh, you want to do something uh, on the astronauts? Mm-hmm. Well, why, or the space program, or the science of the space program, well, you can come to our archive. People do not automatically think of a museum as having an archive. They think That's of libraries. True. They think of universities. But a museum? Nah. Museum is where you go to look at the stuff. They don't have any archives, but, oh, we do. And uh, that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to make people aware of, that you can come. You can come and do research. And you might be surprised what you, what you will find in our archive. I mean, we have so many engineering documents from NASA mm-hmm. that go into the specifics of, of the program itself, how the capsules were built, what the materials were that were used for that Uh a lot of people don't know about that, but we have that. Absolutely. So then that leads to a final question for you then about if people coming out to, again, the Border Archives Bazaar, if you're looking for things or things that might be more relevant to, again, your organization than not, what kind of things might might you be seeking, again, if someone's got a stack of something that they haven't paid attention to, but they find something that you might find more relevant than not for you all? Okay. Well, since our collections uh Mission is basically all, all things dealing with the, not just the American space program, but the Russian space program, even the Chinese space program, which has started out, mm-hmm. because we do have the International Space Hall of Fame. So all of, of that goes into uh, our archives and or our collections. So if anybody has anything, I get a lot of calls. Oh, my dad worked out at Holloman mm, uh, mm-hmm. in, in in the uh, help, helping the people with the rockets. Or uh, I know somebody who was in, involved with the uh, track out there with uh, Colonel Stapp. And we have all sorts of old photographs. Would you be interested in them? Yes. Of course, we have to see them. We have to see, are they relevant? And are they something that we can use? And so far, I've been very lucky mm-hmm. that about 99% of the people who call me and ask me if we're interested in that, yes, they've been absolutely wonderful because what they are they are coming to us with is information from the support groups that helped get the space program, excuse the pun, off the ground because yeah. nobody really knows about them. And these are the people who actually worked on the mechanics of the rockets, who worked on the mechanics of the sleds, who worked on the mechanics of the uh, Space Chimp program, you know, the the technology. And they, they're the everyday people that you just don't think about. I mean, they're over there in the background. People you're going to think about are the ones that the news is covering. John Glenn made it, you know? Of course. So that'll be a little bit of, again, what's on exhibition and what's being sought during, again, the upcoming Border Archives Bazaar, October 22nd at the Farm and Ranch Museum. Got to take that next break right now. But coming out of this break, talk further with more of the organizations represented here, including the NMSU Library Archives. So stay tuned. More on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook. 
where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, make sure to find our weekly promo announcements and what is going on with the new subjects and in-depth local reporting going on each and every week from El Paso Inc. And of course, you can find El Paso Inc., El Paso's business journal online, elpasoinc.com. You can also order it for home or business delivery or get your digital subscription. Again, all of those details, elpasoinc.com. And again, of course, make sure to find our weekly promo announcements, a little bit longer write-up that ends up over there each and every week. But in the meantime, we are, of course, joined here in studio by a bunch of the local archivists in a bunch of different capacities representing both public libraries, uh, private institutions, or public uh, museums, as well as some of the, uh, of course, educational institutions in our area, of course. From my left to right, Claudio Ramirez, the library archivist with the El Paso Public Library's Border Heritage Center, Sue Taylor, chief curator with the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and uh, Dennis Daly, the department head for the NMSU Library Archive. So, Dennis, I want to talk a little bit further with you this segment. Of course, we talked and mentioned, touched on, I guess I should say, what we got going on for your archives, some of the scope and some of the, of course, you know, founding papers for, of course, the institution itself, as well as some of the things relating to a little bit of surrounding areas and the things that, of course, NMSU focuses on. But when it comes to, we have some of the better pictures that you have uh, among the things of actually showing off what the archives look like and how kind of maybe extensive. This may more or less meet people's expectations of what an archive could look like. Again, we're talking about the storage and preservation of documents, not necessarily for display. So it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing way that these are shown off. But again, that's kind of not the point at this point in time. It's to make it so that they are available so they could be displayed, used, uh, otherwise utilized in other ways because they are stored this way, right? Yes, and, and stored in such a way that they're protected. Protected so, and away from, as kind of Sue mentioned there, that even clean hands, we have skin oils. That's one of the reasons that you're not supposed to touch any things that like Carlsbad Caverns is because even just the, your very existence as humans can cause damage to such things because I mean, the, the certain phrases kind of like nature of whores a vacuum come to mind here. And it kind of is a, a little bit against archives in its own way, which means that you'll have your work cut out for you. Sure. Yeah, the preservation of the documents, of course, is, is extremely important, and documents often are damaged when they're handled. Yeah. And so uh, careful handling, careful storage of the documents is, is what's really important for their preservation. 
And you got some examples, again, of the kind of way it takes to do that work. Because, again, it's a lot of research, cataloging. So all of these kind of things are in equal measure because you want to know what you have. I mean, you can have, a, again, perfect set of things in case in, I don't know, acrylic if you want to. But if you can't actually get at them, open them up, do whatever, you're kind of left in a, a catch-22 at that point. Like, yes, preserved, but useful? Mm, not so much. So it's that balancing act. Right. And we get collections in all kinds of states, as you can imagine. Um, mm. Not not states as in states in the Union, but in all kinds of physical states. Uh, often the papers are just dumped into boxes. Sometimes there's some sort of organization to them. But the thing that we all have to do, as Claudia had mentioned, is, is really organize that stuff. Arrange mm. it. Get it into some kind of coherent order. Um, so that it is usable by the public. So the one photograph we were looking at is, was one of our student employees mm -hmm. um, who's doing the work of actually organizing a collection, rehousing the materials into good archival acid-free folders and boxes and things like that so, that so that they will be preserved. And then once they're organized, we need to describe them so that people have a way of discovering them, of finding them and, and uh we do that with what's called a finding aid, which was mentioned earlier, which is basically a catalog of right. a collection, a very in-depth description, folder by folder, of what's in uh, some of these collections. And the collections can be quite large uh, for all of our institutions. Um, in total, we have a little, a little over 2,000 linear feet of paper material. So archivists always measure the size of their collections in linear feet. That okay. is, how much shelf space does it take up? So you can imagine if you took those those gray boxes there and sort of just set them side by side, uh, it mm -hmm. would stretch uh, a little over four miles. <laughs> so Okay, that's a very good, interesting way to put it then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty extensive collection. Um, we have a lot of photographs in the collection as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have actually, we don't exactly know how many, but somewhere between a million and a half and two million uh, photographs in the collection that we've collected. Wow. And all of these materials uh, have largely have been donated mm. by the public, uh, donated by families, donated by individuals, uh, donated by businesses and organizations. And so that's how we get the material. Um, and then we get it organized and then, of course, make it available to the public so that they can use it. Of course, here and of course, and beyond even just the documents or the photos here. Again, we mentioned that films are going to be a part of again the upcoming event that uh, Border Archives Bazaar coming up a little bit later here in October. You mentioned films a part of it, and you got some examples of both what you have in archive and then what you're going to be showing during the event, right? Exactly. So I think all of us probably have some films in our collections. Uh, we're we're no exception to that. Uh, these are a couple of uh, film boxes from a former professor at New Mexico State University who taught there in the uh, starting in the late 1950s and actually made a feature film in, in Las hmm. Cruces, shot it in Las Cruces independent feature film in 1965 called The Devil's Mistress. And uh, okay. And when he retired, he left a lot of stuff in his office at the university, which eventually <laughs> made it over to the archives, okay. including a lot of uh, his uh, footage for for those wow. for for some of those film projects. And we have a professor on campus, Dr. Julia Smith, who's been doing a lot of research into this this gentleman, Orville Wanzer, and the films that he made. Hmm. And Julia will be presenting at the Border Archives Bazaar about uh, Orville Wanzer and some of his films. And, and, and we'll project a little bit of, of some of the film footage. And that, I mean, just to put it in a real kind of case in point of difficulty, I mean, you mentioned some of the specifics there, like at low acid paper, acid free, which most people don't think about. It used, to, it used to be a good example to think about like newsprint, which is not as good or readily available of an example anymore for a lot of people. I mean, it's been years since I've actually bought a newspaper for reading purposes of about of like packing purposes but that's my personal <laughs> issue but point is that i mean people may be familiar when they when they were using it more often about how the newsprint rubs off how it gets on things and that's sure an extreme example but that is to his level happens with pretty much any document that the handling of it wears it down it can wear it out but again the specific of like low acid paper people don't think of like wait paper this is this is acidy and like there's a level of it that's sure in your day-to-day -day use you know you print out something to hand off as a report and then it gets either you know it gets circular filed in that case you don't think about that it's not within the scope of the experience but with y'all talking about when you're wanting to preserve it for generations yeah, even a slight bit of shift on the pH scale can make it where something would not survive as long. 
Absolutely. So, um, yeah, paper is made from, from trees, made from wood. And wood pulp has acids in it, and it has something called lignin in it. And these things, uh, over time, deteriorate. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about archival materials, archival folders and things, those are largely made, they have a high cotton content. Right. Uh, which doesn't have those those bad properties. So if, if you think about um, paper from uh, the past, you know, prior to the to the turn of the 20th century, That's true. most of that paper was made from cotton rag, and you can see paper that's 400 years old that is still in, in just absolutely beautiful condition, unless it's gotten wet or something like that. Right. So the paper, excuse me, the paper that we've produced um, in the 20th century has been particularly bad in terms of its preservation. Yeah, and that's why the digitization is a very incredibly important effort as well. But even then, specifically for the films, and I feel like this one may be a little bit more a little bit more in the popular consciousness, at least in the last decade, of what it actually takes to preserve film. A, there have been, of course, major stories about when, um, unfortunately, one of the studio archives went up in flames a few mm-hmm. years ago mm-hmm. as a great trove was lost there. And again, pushing on the fact that digitization and having other ways to keep it besides just the physical is important. But again, films, because of one particular movie overall, and I'm going to say the name here and hopefully not get in, in trouble, The Inglorious uh, Bees, I'm just going to say it that way, <laughs> it actually they had a whole little segment within it about the problems of holding on to physical film and the dangers of it specifically. So, I mean, I'm not sure if this is that kind of same uh, nitride-based film that you've got here, but I mean, it still presents its own challenges. Sure. Um, I'm not familiar with that movie. I've heard the title, but I haven't, yeah. seen the, I haven't seen the film, so I don't know the reference. But yeah, nit- nitrate film, uh, which was produced in the early 20th century, up until the middle of the, of the 20th century, uh, was particularly prone to, to um, self-combustion, right. uh, particularly the, the movie film, because it's packed so tightly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, Kodak, w- one of the main film manufacturers got away from the nit- nitrate film and started putting film on other types of plastic bases mm-hmm. as the century progressed. And And the film that we were looking at there, uh, by 1960s, they were uh, shooting film on polyester base, and so it's, it's pretty safe. Uh, we do have some nitrate film in our collection, which actually we're just going to have to dispose of pretty soon because it's deteriorated uh. so far that, that, that nothing can be done. Luckily, it was transferred about uh. 25 or 30 years ago so we do have a copy of it but and then in terms of preservation this this kind of um film that's on uh polyester base this will last a long long time so it's very stable it's you know digital material is much more fragile than a lot of the physical materials it's true i mean cds may have a good certain amount of you know firmness to them and said let's you bend them and break them or scratch them and those kind of things but then of course you know uh, sd drives or anything you're gonna have on your cell phone can have other issues with them including uh, you know electromagnetic interference so yeah digitization is a good effort but not necessarily a you know the end all be all because it still has vulnerabilities beyond sure. yeah there are there are a lot of uh, problems with uh, holding on to preserving digital material in the long term um, yeah much less even just uh, in different formats. I mean, think about how since I left school, how much things have changed in terms of the actual physical medium. Remember, I left high school and I got a um, can't remember the name of it. It wasn't a zip disc, but Flop- it also floppy was, disc. No, it was no. it was it was more than a floppy disc, but it wasn't a zip drive either. But it definitely wasn't USB. But so it's basically its own mildly obsolete. I've got a store of it in a closet somewhere, kind of thing here that I just was like, oh, we're getting rid of these. You want it? Oh, sure. I'm sure I could find use for that in college. <laughs> never yeah. ended up using it but it ended up being something that uh yeah that's be my own little bit of archiving on to try and figure out how to make work <laughs> well one of the problems with any kind of digital media is that you you have the physical object but then you need a machine uh, of course to read yep. it and if you don't have the machine you don't have the information as we're getting into issues with vhs now <laughs> right exactly <clears throat> as i yeah. cough sympathetically here <laughs> so uh one point i wanted to make and one thing that you had here is actually a specific document that uh, you brought some examples of with you right yeah, so a lot of what we have in our collections, and this goes for all of the collections that, you know, all of the archives in the region. And, you know, I just mentioned again that there are many, many archives mm-hmm. in southern New Mexico and the El Paso area that you, you would be surprised. Um, and many of those will be represented at the, at the Border Archives Bazaar. But uh, what a lot of us have are family, <laughs> family papers. And within those family papers, uh, there is a lot of correspondence. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that makes up a big part of, of what's in these family papers. And I think either either Claudia or, or Sue was talking about correspondence at some point. But this is right. an example of a letter that we have in one of our collections. Uh, the collection is from a family that lived up in Alma, New Mexico, which is north of Silver City. Mm-hmm. And it's a letter uh, to uh, a person named Laura Weatherby, and that's the name of the collection. And I th- if, if it's all right, I'll just read it sure. uh, pretty quickly because it's, this is just the, and it'll give you an example of the rich kind of cultural and historical material that you can get from just reading somebody's letter to somebody else at the time. So we can see at the top, uh, it's on the letterhead of the Public Utilities Company, uh, mm-hmm. the Carlsbad Electric Power and Light and Telephone Systems. So that tells us right away that the person must have had some connection with that organization to be able to steal their their letter right so it's dated uh the 31st of march 1902 and it says mrs laura weatherby my dear aunt no doubt you was surprised when you heard of my troubles but you was no more surprised than myself aunt laura how much is the fare from silver city to alma i'm coming to you first and perhaps you can take me to mama i am awful young to have trouble but i guess i have to bear it aunt laura Answer soon and tell me the fare from Silver City to Alma. I will tell you the reason I want to come around by Alma to go to Mama because Papa is in Clifton and I know he will abuse me for marrying. But everybody makes mistakes. I have worked and got my divorce. Thank God I am free from him. Aunt Laura, he is of a disposition like Papa. I will tell you all when I get to you. I have $30. I guess that will take me to you. Don't let Mama know anything about my trouble because she will worry herself to death about me. I am still working, getting along very well, but I want to be with some of my people. Here I am all by myself, no relation. I must close as it is about train time, and I want to get this letter on it. I hope I will see you real soon. Give my love to Mr. Weatherby. Answer soon. Your loving niece, Jana McCullough. And then she's put it at the bottom there. I work in the telephone office. And now we know how she got a hold of that letterhead, go. right? There's that connection. Absolutely. Yeah. But there's so much uh, historical and cultural information that can be pulled out of a letter like that to, to learn about what, what was the life experience like for women at, you know, at the turn of the century. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's a very poignant letter and uh, just packed full of information. Absolutely here. So just an example of what y'all will have available and part of the, again, Bazaar, the Border Archives Bazaar put on by the Border Regional Archives Group that people can find out the information on that Facebook group group border regional archives group will also link that up of course to the post once we get that up and available but again that's been dennis daly department head for the new mexico uh, nmsu rather library archives again joining us here in studio as well sue taylor chief curator of the new mexico museum of space history and claudio ramirez library archivist with the el paso public library border heritage center got to take that next break coming out of this break tell you what we got of course uh the event coming up a little more detail on that and close out the show so stay tuned more on the el paso history radio show here on news radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, 
Invest in Real Estate. M1EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com. M numeral one EP.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long term appreciation, call 915 592 4549. 915 592 4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915 588 1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA-TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs. Thank you all so very much for having joined us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk. Again, been talking a lot about this past couple hours about what is coming up for focusing on archives in our region. Of course, we have the example, the specific event with the Border Archives Bazaar going to be happening at the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum Saturday, October 22nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Open to the public and a lot of different things that will be a part of that, including uh, exploring archives and even potentially uh, bringing your own out there. And, of course, we've been talking here in studio with, again, from my left to right, Claudio Ramirez, the library archivist with the El Paso Public Library's Border Heritage Center, Sue Taylor, the chief curator for the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Dennis Daly, department head of the New Mexico Library Archives, and didn't want to be uh, remiss and at least show one of the pictures that you also have from uh, your archive there, Dennis, showing uh, some of the you know, factors of life and what you all are cataloging as well as the many other parts of it but also a further point you want to make besides the event that's coming up the border region uh, archives group or brag as it's known as we mentioned that on facebook also you also do a lot of uh, professional development to keep these skills going all the things that goes into this is not a simple process so professional development is i'm sure very important to you all yeah and you know there are a lot of people uh in the area who work with archival materials who may not have um, specific training mm -hmm. background in it but because of the jobs they have, maybe people working for a county, the county government or a church or something, uh, they're handling these materials and they and they want to know how to preserve them and handle them more carefully. So we mm -hmm. do um, some professional training for for folks, and uh, we recently had a, an archives 101 workshop, a day long workshop, which we held over at the uh, UTEP Special mm -hmm. Collections mm -hmm. with our friends over there um, uh, to help help people um, handle these materials Absolutely. correctly. So, again, some examples of that. And so that's the ongoing stuff that you have going on. But, of course, with this upcoming event, what are the kind of things that you, specifically your organization, will have on uh, exhibition as part of, again, the uh, Border Archives Bazaar? Yeah. Uh, well, we try to pull out a variety of materials. You know, again, we have these family papers, so we usually pull out some things like the letter that we talked about there. We'll, we'll generally mm -hmm. pull out several uh, examples of photographs from the collections. Uh, again, our collections focus on southern New Mexico, so... Most of the materials we'll pull out will, will be related to, to our region, to Las Cruces, Doniana County. 
absolutely it makes a certain level of sense but of course a, a lot of stuff and a lot of exciting things that i'm sure will be or at least for me anyway will be happening out there i'm sure for you all as well so uh, again with that coming up here uh, any final kind of final parting thoughts as we uh, get towards the end of the program here about what you hope people take away from either hearing about this day or going out from the event starting with you claudia um, I hope that people come out and get to know, uh, get get an opportunity to visit all of the tables from all of the institutions and organizations that are going to be present, and you know just get some some info as to what we do, what our collections are like, um, you know our operating hours, what what it takes to go ahead and t- and visit, whether you need an appointment or not. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of the many institutions and organizations that are around that or that hold archival holdings. So I think of. of I hope that people just get a better understanding as to what's available and how um, how we can go about um, helping them with their research or even if they just want to, you know, take a, uh, a drive Saturday afternoon, see what might be of interest, right. you know, we can definitely help them out. Absolutely. And uh, Sue? Uh, pretty much ditto to what Claudia just said. Uh, it's an opportunity to see what is available out there uh, among libraries, universities, museums, and get an idea of the wide range of of research that is available. Not only research, but as listening to the letter that uh, Dennis just read, um, there's some really neat stories out there. And if you are nosy and want to find out more (laughs) about people's lives, I think that is a great way. If that's all you want to do when you go into an archive, uh, why not? You might make the next... uh, Academy Award-winning movie. Absolutely here. And finally, Dennis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, anyone with an interest in history will love this event. Uh, Last time we held the event uh, face-to-face, which was before the pandemic, Mm -hmm. we had about Mm -hmm. 200 people come out. Uh, A lot of those people had had driven up uh, from El Paso to Las Cruces for the Mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, yeah, if you are interested in history, if you love history, um, this event is for you. Absolutely. Um, you'll, you'll come face to face with documents from our region's past. You'll be able to hear some great speakers talk about historical topics and, and their work with archives. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, again, that coming up at the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum, October 22nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Again, details on that be posted over on the Border Regional Archives Group on Facebook. Again, we have been talking a lot these past couple hours with, again, that right there was uh, Dennis Daly, Department Head for New Mexico Library Archives, Sue Taylor, Chief Curator for the New Mexico Museum of Space History, and Claudia Ramirez, Library Archivist with the El Paso Public Library Border Heritage Center. Thank you all very much for being here today to talk about all of these things going on. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you all very much. And thank you for joining us for the Paso History Radio Show. Be back with you next week on the program. Have a great weekend, y'all.